Today's speakers are Angela Colbers and Rick Grupink. Dr. Colbers is a biomedical scientist trained at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands, where she also obtained her PhD in the field of clinical pharmacology. Since 1995, she's been involved in clinical trial management, analysis, and reporting. She's the project coordinator of a protocol entitled Study on Pharmacokinetics of Newly Developed Antiretroviral Agents in, in HIV-Infected Pregnant Women, HANA. In addition, Dr. Colbers teaches and advises PhD and other students on developing and executing clinical trials, and she supports senior scientists with their research. Dr. Rick Rupink is an assistant professor at the, of pharmacology at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. He holds a PharmD from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and obtained his PhD in pharmacokinetics and drug delivery from the same university. He further specialized as a pharmacologist during, the, during postdoctoral fellowships in both clinical and preclinical settings in the pharmaceutical industry and academia. At the Radboud University Medical Center, Dr. Grupink is faculty in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, where his research focuses on investigating the pharmacological roles of drug transporting membrane proteins. Rick and Angela, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to Angela to begin the presentation. Thank you, uh, Susan, for the kind introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank Satara for the invitation to give the scientific webinar on this interesting and important topic. Uh, I'll start my presentation introducing the topic, explaining why it's so important to do a research uh, in, uh, for antiretrovirals in HIV-infected pregnant women. Um, in 2016, approximately 1.4 million HIV-infected women in the world gave birth. And without intervention of antiretrovirals, the risk of uh, transmission of HIV from mother to child would be 15 to 40 percent. And we'll start with an interact interactive uh, question right away uh, via menti.com. <laughs> you can go to menti.com now and use the code 3852. Nine eight, and you can see the question on the on the um, screen. So the question would be: What is the percentage of mother-to-child transmission of HIV when an HIV-positive woman is treated effectively with antiretroviral therapy? Would that be less than two percent, three to ten percent, or? 10 to 20 percent. I see that most of you, most people who are using menti.com think that it is very active, this therapy. Are there more people who want to vote? <laughs> no, we'll go. To the answer, and the answer is actually that it's that it's really drastically reduced to less than one percent. That means that of these 1.54 million births, uh, we can reduce the possible new infections of the babies from 560,000 to less than 14,000, which is really a great achievement. So you could say you can stop now with your presentation because the problem is almost solved. But I would like to stress that the treatment options uh, in HIV for pregnant women really lag behind the treatment options of non-pregnant women or men. As you can see here uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the treatment options, the preferred treatment options of non-pregnant uh, patients, and in green, uh, you can see the options, which are also options for pregnant women, which are on the right. In red, you can see that dolutegravir and alfategravir and TAF are options uh, which are very much uh, 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 the, the, where non-pregnant uh, HIV-infected patients are treated with are not available for pregnant women or are not preferred uh, treatment options in pregnant women. 
And dolutegravir is one of the newer antiretroviral agents. So why do these treatment options lag behind for pregnant women? Pregnant women are usually excluded from clinical trials in the development phase of new drugs. You can imagine why, because we do not know any safety information uh, for the new unborn child, and also we do not know whether the compounds will cross the placenta or not. After marketing of a drug, the pharmaceutical companies have, uh, have to maintain a pharmacovigilance uh, registry of pregnancy cases and outcomes, but that's after marketing. And also after marketing of uh, the drugs, academic groups perform pharmacokinetic studies in pregnancy, uh, and that also lags behind a bit. So that's why we have this lag time uh, between FDA approval and data in pregnancy becoming available. So how long is this lag time? As you can see in this slide, it's quite a number of years after FDA approval that these uh, that information on pregnancy in, of these antiretroviral agents comes available. You can see that the, uh, the, the numbers in the slide represent the year of registration of the FDA, FDA, of the FDA approval. And you can see that uh, in the beginning, uh, the, the, the older drugs for these pregnancy information became available within two years after, after FDA approval. But of the newer compounds, uh, it takes six to eight years, and for efavirenz, even 15 years after every year approval that we get uh, important pharmacokinetic information on bigger groups. And as you can see in this slide, for dolutegravir and alfategravir, cobicistat and TAF, which are the newer compounds, which are uh, uh, very much used in the population, we do not have data yet. And for dolutegravir, it is almost four years ago that it has been marketed. So why do we think it's important to have this information? Well, we know that adequate maternal exposure to antiretroviral drugs is necessary for maximal reduction of viral load and reduce, reduce risk of transmission. And we also know that despite antiretroviral therapy, which works very well for mother to child uh, to prevent mother to child transmission. In some studies, we see that approximately 13% of the women still had a detectable viral load at the time of delivery, despite the use of antiretrovirals. So how come? We think that uh, that this could be due to some pregnant some physiological changes that take place during pregnancy, uh, which can influence the pharmacokinetics of drugs. So you see that in the absorption phase, uh, a gastric pH and gastric emptying uh, uh, changes in the, for the distribution. You can, you can imagine that the women get bigger, so, so the volume of distribution will be bigger as well. Uh, plasma volume increases and albumin concentrations decrease. On the metabolism side, we know that the hepatic blood flow increases and some enzyme activity increases as well, and renal, pre, uh, renal excretion increases also. So the next uh, interest active part will take place on the menti.com. You can go to menti.com again, and you can use the code 3852 Nine eight, and the question is, what is the overall effect of pregnancy on drug exposure? Is it always de always decreased, always increased, or are both for options possible? I think nobody is, for, is uh, nobody voting. No. <laughs> oh, I do. I, I saw the the lines coming up. Um, Two people think that it's always decreased, and 11 uh, people think that both options are possible. <laughs> right. Sh should I show, put show the middle? I don't know. We can go back to the, I will give you the solution. Actually, most of the people had it right because 
here in these slides you can see uh, the maternal exposure to antiretrovirals in pregnancy. On the left hand side you see the concentration time curves for darunavir. Uh, the green arrow points to the concentration curve in pregnancy and the yellow one to the non-pregnant situation so you see that the concentrations during pregnancy are decreased. However, on the right hand side you see itravirin concentration during pregnancy and there the upper uh, concentration curve is the curve during pregnancy. So for itravirin, we know that the concentrations are higher during pregnancy. And uh, the mechanism behind that is probably because CYP2C19 is uh, inhibited, inhibited during pregnancy and not induced like CYP3A4, which is the main uh, enzyme metabolizing uh, darunavir. So we wanted, in 2008, we thought that it was important to know all these pharmacokinetic changes during pregnancy and their relevance. And we set up this PANA network, as Suzanne told you, which is a European clinical pharmacology network to investigate the pharmacokinetics of newly developed uh, antiretroviral agents in HIV-infected pregnant women. You can go to the website uh, after the, the webinar to check out our study. And now, in, how did we set up this study? It's a general study protocol in which we investigate uh, over 18 antiretroviral drugs. It's not specified per drug, but it's all in one protocol. And uh, pregnant HIV-infected women who are using at least one of these drugs can participate in the study. We collect a full pharmacokinetic curve during the third trimester of pregnancy. And in the same women, we uh, collect a pharmacokinetic curve four to six weeks after they gave birth. And at uh, delivery, we also try to get a cord blood sample to um, uh, assess whether the new drugs cross the placenta or not. But you can imagine that setting up such a study and performing such a study is really a lot of work and involves uh, a lot of effort. And uh, actually, this study is running in 25 hospitals in seven European countries. And, um, uh, and also for the women, it's quite, a level, it's quite a thing to go to the hospital uh, the entire day to get a curve taken. So we thought that it could be an option to make it easier uh, to study these pharmacokinetic changes. So we thought uh, of this piano project, um, and that is a pharmacokinetic investigation of antiretroviral agents in HIV-infected pregnant women, so that's the same, but we'll choose a physiologically-based predictions and clinical validation method, the piano study, which is funded by the Dutch government as well. So the aims of the PIANO study are to describe a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model that simulates maternal pharmacokinetics in pregnancy. And to, uh, we do that to aid in better dose prediction for this patient population. Uh, so to anticipate drug effects and maybe uh, uh, also know which new dose would overcome uh, um, changes in pharmacokinetics of the drugs. And we also wanted to identify current knowledge gaps that limit the accurate PB, accuracy of the PVPK modeling. So how did we do that? We used the, the SIMSIP uh, uh, pregnancy model, uh, and uh, we also did uh, some in vitro tests ourselves because uh, we knew that some, well, we found out that some data were lacking. And we validated these uh, concentrations with um, the results from the PANA study. So how did we start? We, we had to start with one drug, we thought. So we chose Darunavir as one of the antiretrovirals, which are the one of, is one of the preferred antiretrovirals used in pregnancy. And, but we didn't make it very easy on ourselves because Darunavir is always combined with Tritonavir. Um, as a booster. So darunavir is a CYP3A4 uh, substrate and ritonavir inhibits CYP3A4 
and that makes it uh, uh, that increases the Dahunavir concentration. So we also had to model the interaction, not only the pregnancy effect. Uh, we developed the PVPK model in SimSIP, uh, the PVPK simulator version at 13.2, and as I told you already, we determined some missing or unclear uh, in vitro pharmacokinetic data. Uh, for example, Darunavir enzyme uh, kinetics uh, and uh, Ritonavir KE on 3A4. We actually took a stepwise approach. So the first step was to develop a PVPK model for a single dose unboosted Darunavir, for which also uh, clinical data were available to validate this model. Um, then we included Ritonavir uh, to cover the interaction. Uh, and we also simulated the steady state situation of the Darunavir so with uh, Ritonavir in non-pregnant uh, population first. And then we simulated the steady state uh, uh, concentrations of Darunavir with Ritonavir in the pregnant population, and we also simulated some dose adaptation. So we set out uh, with the Darunavir single dose uh, uh, simulation with our first model, and we were a bit disappointed because here you can see the black dots are the observed concentrations and the, and the lines represent the uh, geometric mean concentrations which were simulated with the 95% confidence intervals. Uh, and we were really overestimating the exposure. So we were thinking what could be the reason. I think we gave it away a bit in, this, uh, in the slides already. Uh, so we used the Dolph third liver model, and we didn't uh, uh, include transporters at that time. And we thought that might be the solution for our problem, because uh, we know that Darunavir, uh, that transporters play a role in Darunavir pharmacokinetics or pharmacology. We knew that uh, both uptake and efflux transporters uh, played a role, but we didn't have quantitative data available that describe these Darunavir transporters like KM, Vmax, or intrinsic clearance. So what we did is we did a sensitivity analysis. Uh, uh, we actually changed the, uh, the intrinsic clearance of the uptake, inhibit, uh, uptake transporter and of the efflux transporters. And uh, this was the result, which really our, the, the stimulation line fits the dots very well now. Uh, so including transporters really uh, improved our model. As you can see here, the upper line was the, uh, the model simulation without transporters. So this was the model we were going to work with. And then after that, the second step was to include uh, Ritonavir and as an interactive agent. Uh, this graph, we, we used uh, the Ritonavir model from SimSIP, which was available in the, uh, in the SimSIP simulator already, and we adapted the model a bit. Um, and this graph shows that the pharmacokinetic parameters we simulated, CMAX and AUC, for both uh, regimens uh, which are used for the Runavir treatment. So the Runavir is uh, used at 600, 100 milligram BID treatment and 800, 100 milligram QD treatment. So the 600 is the Runavir and the 100, 100 milligram is the Ritonavir. And this graph uh, shows that the, the line you see in the middle is the line of unity and you see that the, 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 the CMAX we predicted and the ACs were within the two-fold difference uh, from the observed data we had. So we were very happy with this interaction model as well, and we moved on to the pregnant situation with Darunavir and Ritonavir. We tested both uh, regimens again, so this is the, uh, these are the simulations and observed data for the pregnancy, pregnant situation on the left, um, and you can see that we predicted these concentrations very well. And on the right, you can see the, the postpartum concentration 
uh, and they were predicted as uh, very well as well. And you can uh, see from this slide that the concentrations of the runevir, the exposure is lower during pregnancy compared to the postpartum concentration, uh, postpartum situation. The same was true for the 800-100 milligram once daily um, uh, darunavir ritonavir regimen. Uh, the curves fit a little bit less well, but it's still within the twofold difference which we um, we identified at first. So here you also see that that there's quite a lower exposure in pregnancy, and we acceptably predicted the model. We still have some discussion points, discussion points regarding the model. We still have these uncertainties, as I told you, is that the, uh, we could not, uh, we haven't determined the uptake and efflux transporter uh, uh, intrinsic clearance yet, and uh, we didn't uh, address the role of intestinal transporters at the, in this model. Uh, the Ritornavir model was uh, used as a semi-mechanistic model, uh, and uh, also for Darunavir, uh, the absorption was not fully mechanistic, uh, which was more a top-down approach, but the rest of the model was, uh, was really uh, a bottom-up uh, approach for this model. And which is, what is also very important, uh, what we think, is that fetal exposure could not be assessed using this model. And Rick will uh, uh, come back on that in his presentation. So to conclude is uh, that our data support the presence of a clinically relevant role of this hepatic transporters in the Runevir pharmacokinetics. And the described model uh, approximated boosting by ritonavir and also the decrease in maternal darunavir exposure during pregnancy. And to improve the mechanistic basis of the model, we propose that future studies should address hepatic, but also intestinal transport from mediated darunavir disposition in more detailed detail. And we've published this, uh, uh, this, the development of the model and the model uh, in clinical pharmacokinetics, which is open access, you, so you can uh, have a look at it if you want. So this concludes my part of the talk. So are there any questions of the audience? Okay, thanks so much, Angela. Um, we'd like to invite the audience now to please submit their questions to Dr. Colbers in the Q&A um, box. Looks like we've got some questions from the audience. Um, Angela, someone would like to know, have physiological changes in, in pregnant women uh, normalized at four to six weeks after they, they deliver the baby? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we, we've, uh, we have been questioning, questioning that ourselves because, um, well, you know that when you have been pregnant, four to six weeks after you, you delivered, uh, you're, you, it doesn't feel as if uh, you're in the normal situation again. Uh, but we have uh, uh, looked at the physiological parameters like albumin concentrations and, uh, and other things in the, within the PANA network because we have got quite a lot of um, data in our database now. And these really uh, came back to normal at, uh, from at least four weeks after uh, delivery onwards. So I think that most parameters would be uh, normalized at that stage. Someone would like to know, are the intrinsic clearance for uptake and efflux transporters derived from the sensitivity analysis in the physiological range? Yeah, yeah, we have, uh, um, we have looked at that because we didn't want that we we weren't confident uh, uh, if, if it wouldn't, and we had a, a, an, for both the uptake and the efflux uh, transporter, we had a, an intrinsic clearance, an optimal intrinsic clearance of 100, which is in the physiological range. We have looked at that, and you can find that uh, uh, also in our paper, that it's, uh, that it's for both uh, uptake and efflux transporters, it's in the uh, physiological uh, range. So it's, it's not... Uh, 
an out of range uh, uh, figure which we but we came up with from the sensitivity analysis. I think that's important. Why do you collect PK curves in the third trimester of pregnancy? And not earlier. Yeah, uh, that's we think that um, at in the third trimester of pregnancy, the physiological uh, uh, changes are sort of maximum. So uh, that we, uh, if we see an effect of pregnancy, we would see it in the in the third trimester. So that's what that's why we collect curves in the third trimester. But uh, I think it's also uh, um, uh, it would be important to know the rate, the, the, the changes over the gestational age. And uh, the PBPK model could help us with that. So if we have uh, these information, we know now that the, that the model of the Runevier um, uh, predicts the concentration, the, the exposure in the third trimester quite well. So we can um, uh, simulate the uh, effects in the second trimester as well. Looks to be the last question from our audience. Did you only analyze total darunavir concentrations, or did you also analyze free darunavir concentrations? Uh, for the, uh, the, the the concentrations I've showed in the slide, uh, that are the total darunavir concentrations, but we actually did measure, uh, did, did also assess the free concentrations of darunavir, and they, they were not uh, change during pregnancy. So that's the good news because the free concentrations are, um, are, the, con the, are, are the ones that hit the target, let's say. So that's uh, the, the, which are effective. So that's, that's good. I actually didn't look at it in the, in the PBPK model. I should do that. Okay. Thanks, Angela. Um, I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Rick for his section. Okay. Uh, thanks, Suzanne. So let me uh, put up the first slide. Yeah, so, so where Angela left off was uh, that it's very well possible, at least for certain types of drugs, to predict maternal exposure with the Simpson PPK model. Um, but what about fetal exposure? So uh, often people are worried about uh, fetal exposure to drugs resulting in adverse effects. So the thalidomide example is, is really well known, obviously that uh, resulted in detrimental effects to the fetus. But fetal exposure to drugs may also result in therapeutic benefits, uh, which might actually be the case, for instance, in treating uh, women that are pregnant with antiretroviral agents. Um, because uh, what you would like to aim for is maybe uh, prevent uh, transmission of the virus from the mother to the child. And fetal exposure might contribute to that. Um, however, in order to do so, you need a way to link external dose uh, administered to the mother to fetal exposure, such as uh, C minus, C max, or AUCs, and if possible, also um, make a link to fetal response in terms of antiretroviral agents. This might be linking uh, exposure to the degree in which the virus is inhibited, for instance, EC90 values for inhibition of viral replication. Thing is that the fetus is obviously not easily accessible. Uh, and quantifying fetal exposure is, is pretty challenging. And uh, as noted also by, by others, um, fetal drug exposure at term can be assessed to some extent. So you can measure, as Angela also mentioned in her part of the talk, measure uh, uh, umbilical cord to maternal uh, plasma concentration ratios. Uh, the problem with that is uh, that it is a rather static parameter. So in this nice graph in the middle of the slide, you can see that the uh, outcome of the core to uh, maternal plasma concentration ratio really depends on the time point at which you take the samples uh, in the dosing interval. So uh, if you, uh, in this example, uh, sample really early on uh, after dosing, you might get a ratio of zero, the maternal plasma concentration being very high, core concentration being uh, non-existent yet, because there's a time delay of transfer of drug to the fetus. When you take it in the middle of the dosing interval, it might uh, come out as a unity, but if you take it at the end of the dosing interval, it might even end up at a very high number, as maternal plasma concentrations might have dropped already, and cord plasma concentrations are maybe still existent. 
So uh, just measuring core to maternal plasma concentrations uh, might not be a very good estimate of overall fetal exposure. And PBPK modeling may provide an alternative to better estimate fetal exposure throughout the dosing interval. Um, so what we set out to do is develop a pregnancy PBPK model uh, in which we could also accommodate uh, the fetal exposure, as this was not present yet in the, uh, in the model that was used uh, for the maternal exposure. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. So I think we have a slight slightly a technical problem, uh, so a computer problem. Um, so maybe, Suzanne, if you can forward the slides, and yep. then I can comment on what's on the slides. Is that a good idea? Yes, yeah, does that work? Okay, that would work. So um, I am now at the slide that illustrates the aim. So it would be great if, if we could develop a pregnancy PPK model in which we could uh, input maybe in vitro or ex vivo data to quantitatively predict fetal exposure following maternal dosing. Uh, and also try to uh, uh, get the next aim, which is to assess if the predicted fetal exposure using our PVPK model may contribute to an antiviral effect. So if you would forward to the next slide, please, Suzanne. Um, then um, we use the following setting. We started off with the, the Runavir, Ritonavir maternal PVPK model. Uh, as we already had a model available to predict maternal exposure, we took that as a starting point. Um, but now we included placental transfer of the Runeve in the model, uh, but we had to use an in vitro input for parameterization of such a PVPK model. Um, so although we had, good, we had a good starting point, uh, the problem was how to parameterize such a, uh, a fetal uh, PVPK model in which placental transfer could be included. And uh, the, the thing is that you then have to model or at least assess the degree to which drugs pass the human placenta. And if you go to the next slide, Suzanne, so that's slide number 31, then you can see a nice uh, overview of the, uh, the human uh, placental barrier. Uh, so if you, if you examine the placental barrier uh, in some detail, you can see that the placenta exists out of uh, functional units which are called cotyledones. It's, it's similar to, for instance, nephrons that are present in a kidney, uh, which function rather independently. And as you can see in the picture, maternal arteries uh, supply the blood uh, to, to the placenta, and maternal blood flows into the placenta where they empty in the so-called intervillage spaces. And here, uh, blood flows along the placental villi which accommodate the fetal blood vessels. And in this way, fetal and maternal blood come into close contact to each other, although they are separated by some cell layers. So if you zoom in on the actual barrier, uh, this is how it looks like under the microscope. And if you forward to the next slide, Suzanne, then you can see on slide number 32 that you, uh, uh, when you take a microscopical uh, image of a section of a human placenta, you can see, uh, well, a lot of structures there, but as denoted with the letter I, you can see the uh, intervillous spaces, uh, which is basically where the maternal blood is. And then you can also see all these patches of tissue, uh, which is basically the, the, the fetal tissue. So that's the, um, uh, just the, 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 those are the villi where the um, fetal blood vessels uh, are located. And you can see a fetal blood vessel uh, denoted with the letters F, uh, V, fetal blood vessel. Some uh, supportive tissue is next to it, obviously. Um, but, well, how to get from the maternal space to the fetal blood vessels is basically you have to pass a, uh, a, barrier, to, uh, a barrier cell line which is denoted with the letter S, which are the syncytiotrophoblasts. And this picture that you can see on this slide is stained for P-glycoprotein, which is a, a transport protein present in the syncytiotrophoblast, nicely indicated with the brown staining. And you can see that this barrier is not just a passive barrier, but it's an active barrier. So there's not only cells uh, that might prevent passage of large molecules or very hydrophilic molecules across the placenta, but there are also transport proteins present that might efflux drugs that initially have diffused into the uh, syncytiotrophoblast and transport them back into the maternal blood. So this is a protective effect, basically, for the, for the fetus. Um, so you, to provide a way to get input data for the PUPK model, 
we used uh, placenta perfusion experiments to uh, to be able to um, uh, to parameterize the model. model. And um, you can see schematic representation of the setup in this uh, in the slide, slide number 33, um, in which we uh, rush the placentas that we get from our delivery rooms to the laboratory, hopefully within half an hour time, and we reestablish the fetal as well as the maternal circulations and perfuse the placenta, or at least one codalidon, because we only cannulate one functional unit, with a Krebs-Henselite buffer, uh, which is oxygenated, so it keeps the tissue alive, and then you can perfuse these uh, placental cotridones for approximately three to maybe six hours if, if you're lucky. Uh, we apply physiological flows, uh, fetal flow of six milliliters per minute and maternal flow of 12 milliliters per minute. And uh, we did two sets of perfusions to assess the transfer of the runavir from the maternal to the fetal circulation and from the fetal to the maternal circulation back again. And um, we did this under sync conditions, so we let the compartment in which we added the drug recirculate, but the flow that's on the other side, we uh, let that empty into beakers so we could sample, and basically this also provided sync conditions, which allowed us to establish intrinsic clearance values from one, one side to the other side and back again. So if you move to the next uh, slide, you can see how it looks like uh, in real. So I think we're back online again, yeah? So this is the next slide. Um, you can see on the left a nice image of our lab. So we have the perfusion uh, chambers. We have, we have two available, a water bath to keep the buffers at the, the right temperature, and a lot of pumps that facilitate flow through the code lead on. And um, in the middle, you can see a cannulation of the fetal side, a fetal artery, and a fetal vein being cannulated, uh, perfusion being reestablished. And when you turn over the... Uh, the piece of the placenta, you can see a nice discoloration of a single coat lead on because it's been perfused with Krebs Henselite buffer. And you can see that we stick in a number of cannulas at the maternal side to mimic the spiral arteries that supply maternal blood to the to the placenta. And in this way, we have a recirculating uh, system which you, which you can use to study drug disposition and get your data from. And on the next slide, you can uh, see well, a very simple representation of how we can uh, get data. So in the upper left uh, graph, you can see the disappearance of the runavir when it is added to the maternal circulation. You can see disappearing from the maternal reservoir, and from the disappearance curve, we can estimate clearance values, uh, basically by doing a, a log transformation on natural, uh, on natural logarithm basis, and get an elimination rate constant from that, and multiply it with the volume of distribution, which is the volume of the reservoir. And in this way, we can get a clearance value, which is 0 0.9 plus minus 0 0.1 milliliters per minute for the transport from the maternal side to the fetal side. And the other way around, you can generate similar data and get a clearance value of 1.6 plus minus 0 0.3 milliliters per minute from fetal to maternal side. So that's nice. So then we have intrinsic clearance values uh, for one codedon, but in order to do PPK predictions, we need to scale up again to uh, what uh, the entire placenta does in terms of uh, clearing this drug from one, one side to the other side. And on the next slide, you can see uh, how we scaled it. We scaled it based on the number of codedons that are on average present in the placenta, uh, which is known from literature, approximately 30 are there. You could also base it on scaling based on volume or maybe on weight. Uh, but in this way, we uh, scale intrinsic clearance from the code lead on to a clearance of a complete placenta. And then we also correct for protein binding as we have some protein present in our perfusion system so we can also determine unbound clearance and this is what we enter into our PBPK model. So on the next slide, uh, we have a PBPK model uh, and uh, the, the most part of the model takes up the maternal uh, disposition uh, features, so brain, heart, kidney, muscle, skin, liver, uh, lung, adipose, and bone, which is all the, the maternal uh, uh, model, which is parameterized with the data that represent a pregnant woman in the third trimester. And on the right side, we included our uh, placental disposition data, basically in a very simple manner. So we included the clearance uh, value, which describes flux from the maternal arterial blood to the fetal blood uh, pool, and the clearance value that um, describes flux back from the fetal blood flow to the maternal venous blood pool. And then there's some disposition in a very limited way included from fetal blood to the rest of the fetal uh, body, 
and also uh, rate constants that describe transport from the fetal blood to the amniotic fluid and back again, which is based on uh, swallowing constants, for instance, the fetus swallowing uh, amniotic fluid, which is a way to recirculate basically drug um, from the fetal blood to the amniotic fluid to describe at least uh, some kind of disposition there. Um, we do not include uh, clearance data otherwise than passage across the placenta, so there's no uh, hepatic clearance included in the model yet. But nevertheless, when using this model, we were able to capture clinical data of fetal exposure in a well, quite a, quite a well manner. So that's on the next slide. Here you can see that we simulated two dosing regimens. On the left side, the 600, uh, 100 milligram twice daily dosing regimen. In green, you can see the uh, predictions of the maternal exposure uh, and the data points, the, depth, the, the black dots are the, the measured data. Uh, and in purple, you can see the exposure the predictions for the cord blood samples. And you can see that the predicted uh, uh, exposure is uh, relatively in line with the observed cord blood samples, which are denoted with the open circles. And the same holds true for the 800, 100 milligram Dorunivir Ritonivir regimen once daily. Um, so we captured exposure in this way, although the model is not really complete yet in terms of clearance maybe, we were able to capture it. And then we questioned, okay, is it possible to link exposure maybe to what we know about um, viral um, sensitivity to exposure to these drugs? So that's on the next slide. We did an analysis of, well, different dosing regimens, twice daily regimen or once daily regimen, which you can see on the right side of the slide. Um, uh, different dosing regimens. In the middle, you can see the standard dosing regimen, 600 milligrams twice daily or 800 milligrams once daily. And um, then we um, express this relative to the EC50 that the Runovar has on inhibiting replication of resistant fires, which is approximately 0.55 milligrams per liter. It's denoted in the graph as the horizontal, horizontal dotted line. You can see that the standard dosing regimen in terms of fetal exposure stays above this level, also for the trough levels. And this you can drop below or stay further above it with the other dosing uh, regimens. So allowing to simulate these different exposure scenarios, we were able to at least say something about whether this exposure might contribute to uh, viral inhibition and transmission of the virus from the mother to the child, um, which was rather nice. So um, this is where we, we ended basically our exercise because we had to generate a lot of preclinical data, establish the model, which we'd like to expand later on. Um, so I'd like to move to the next slide, which is a discussion slide. Um, obviously, we managed to simulate fetal exposure, but it was limited to end-stage pregnancy, end pregnancy, and no parameter variability was included. So we simulated mean values. Um, uh, we also used term placentas, right, so, so not preterm placentas, and also the maternal disposition model was based on third uh, trimester women, as Angela also explained. Uh, which would be nice if we could uh, uh, and extrapolate back maybe to early stages of pregnancy. Um, would also be good to include more complex placental and fetal models, which include transporters, maybe tissue composition, also SIP expression and SIP activity in the fetal liver, which may allow even better predictions of fetal exposure, at least make an assessment to what extent this contributes and in which situations it might contribute. Um, and ultimately, we hope that this allows uh, an uh, an additional way to do dose optimization during maternal pharmacotherapy and maybe also fetal drug treatments. So one of the final slides is this one. This is also the, the slide that Angela started off with, and she mentioned that the first pregnancy PK data comes available rather late after registration of drug, but by using these type of modeling and simulation techniques, we might be able to do placenta perfusions, maybe even before FDA approval takes place, and might yield also first pregnancy PK data earlier after FDA approval to be able to better steer and direct maternal dosing of drugs. So then I would like to go to the final slide because there are a lot of people who are involved in this. The majority of the work of the uh, second bit of the presentation was done by one of our PhD students, Stein Schalkwijk, who did a very good job on this. Uh, the work was supervised by Professor Franz Russell, molecular pharmacologist, David Berger, clinical pharmacologist, both working in our laboratories. 
Um, we are able to continue this work uh, thanks to a Sertara Simpson grant on which Julien Frederiksen is working, one of our PhD students, and also a lot of enthusiastic students have been involved, among others, Carlijn Lichens, who did a lot of work on determining KMV max values for the Runeveer on SIP 3A4 to parameterize the maternal model. Then we are indebted to Joris van Drongelen, gynecologist, who provides the placentas and a lot of technical support in analysis and immunistic chemical staining, for instance, which is done by enthusiastic technicians in our department, Sianne Partijs, Peter van der Broek, and Marga Teulen. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, Suzanne, I give the floor back to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, we'd like to invite our audience to submit your questions in the Q&A box for Rick. Um, so someone would like to know, you managed to simulate fetal exposure at term, but what about modeling placental transfer earlier on in pregnancy? Yeah, yeah, that is a good question. The, the thing is that, um, so by doing these placental perfusion experiments, we are able to capture the entire uh, human placental barrier at term with all its active components, transporter proteins, enzymes that might be expressed at term, which allows us to parameterize at least, uh, well, transfer parameters at term. But if you would like to do it earlier on in pregnancy, you have to take into account changes that take place in physiology uh, throughout gestation. So uh, hemodynamics change, blood flows change, uh, there is expression of transporters change, uh, which you need to accommodate. So you could, it's difficult to do placenta perfusions with placentas that are obtained earlier on in pregnancy. It's just difficult to do it technically. So you would need to move to a different way of parameterizing your model. So you could use cell systems, which you can use to assess passive transfer maybe across the placental barrier, like you also do when you parameterize a PVPK model for, for intestinal absorption. And then you can add to that maybe active transport components in overexpression systems. But in, able to do, in order to do IV, IVE, you would also need to know expression levels of all these active components in the placental barrier. And simply, not a lot of data is available right now. I know a lot of groups are working on that. We are working on it. University of Washington is working on it. Other people are working on it, which would help really a lot in parameterizing such models early on in pregnancy. Someone would like to know, um, someone says, from the model structure, I noticed that you do not include fetal hepatic clearance pathways for your drugs. Isn't this yep. a factor that should be incorporated in the model? Yeah, I also mentioned it indeed. But yeah, thanks for the question. So the, um, so, so, you, so you would, I mean, um, uh, you know that the, at least our drug, the Zunovir is a CYP3A4 substrate, which is administered together with Ritonavir, which is a CYP3A4 inhibitor. So. Uh, you, but you might expect some metabolism taking place in the fetal liver, but you would have to take into account then also that cyp 3 f 4 expression changes um, uh, throughout pregnancy. Uh, I don't know if it's really matured at term uh, completely, but I do know that other variants of CYP enzymes, so cyp 3 a 7 compensate partly for lack of cyp 3 a 4 function. So you need to really know about the ontogeny of um, of these uh, SIP enzyme expressions. So as we have a model at term, you could argue that you could use data that are also known from neonates and use that to parameterize the model. So we, so we should take a look at that and maybe also include it in sensitivity analysis to see how much it could contribute to uh, fetal, expo fetal exposure. It really depends on the magnitude of the clearance mechanism relative to the clearances back and forth across the placenta. For instance. So we should do that, it's a good question. Looks like we have uh, one final question from our audience. You modeled fetal, uh, sorry, you modeled placental transfer by including clearance values from mother to fetus and vice versa, but you didn't include a placental compartment in which the drug can accumulate. Wouldn't it be relevant to include placenta as a compartment as well? Yeah, it would. Uh, so there, there are some good models available uh, out there. So uh, I think it's a nice paper by Zhang who uh, to take a similar approach and describe a nice paper. Obviously, they have a placental compartment there 
also uh, paper by the SUSA et al. Uh, include the placental compartment. And, and I, I think that's also what we should do. And from a pharmacological perspective, it's really relevant. So you can see accumulation of drug within the placenta taking place. We know it for certain drugs that it does take place. And if you reach really high exposure levels within the placental tissue, this might also contribute to adverse effect. Everybody is always worried about effects taking place on the fetus. But uh, developmental toxicity might also be due to interference of drugs with placental processes. And, well, modeling exposure within a placental compartment, uh, assessing unbound drug concentrations within the placental compartment, might also uh, allow us to get a better grip on uh, toxic effects that might be induced by concentrations in the placenta on, on key placental processes, such, such as hormone production or, or maybe vascular responses that may take place in the placenta. So that, that's a good... Um, Good way to go. I think we're also trying to do that. Uh, well, in the in the continuum period, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, before concluding the webinar, we have.